Is it was for me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't do that to me.
speakers you'd like, somebody you'd like to have us bring in for a meeting or facility tours of particular topics. Um, feel free to contact me or any of the other people, the officers of the AES here. There's a sign up sheet here if you're interested. If you're not a member of AES, everybody's welcome to come to these meetings. They're free. But if you're not a member, you'd like to become a member. So you sign up to list and you can come and um, that, pleasure. Is all good? Yes. Thanks. So, um, basically, what I what I like to do mostly is you know question and answer sort of things. Um, this this guide that I passed out. Uh, you know, I've done lots of different seminars and class-oriented uh, speaking uh, tours, and they're mostly just targeted to um, people that have project studios and are always running into problems. Um, over the years, I've compiled all these little problematic things that have come up and tried to put together this little guide that um, usually uh, answers a lot of the questions that, that people have about um, problems in their little uh, uh, production studios. Um, so it's it's not meant to be um, uh, you know talking down to anybody or anything. It's just these are the same sort of things that I have to have notes to myself even when I'm going into a studio. I mean sometimes I'll work years on a project. Um, mostly in the overdub stages and things, and, and it might be two years before I go into a studio and start cutting tracks again. And I'll walk in for the first time and go, Ugh, what do I do now? And uh, luckily I have usually second engineers that are pretty knowledgeable that'll come in and you know slap me around and bring me to my senses and tell me how to set microphones on a piano again and, and uh, get me going. But uh, um, there's just, you know, all these things from you, any anything that you work at on your own that you that you get pretty familiar with, um, you forget that that other people have uh, or maybe not the, the same uh, amount of time spent on a particular job as you are, and so you sort of get complacent about well, gee, I know how to do this, so it's easy. Everybody should know how to do this, and you start forgetting about the fact that that uh, there's, there's people that are uh, struggling with some of the things that you think are um, a piece of cake, but if you think back about it, when you started, you were struggling with them too. You know, it's, it's uh, I've had tons of problems with, you know, bad mic cables and blaming it on the wrong piece of equipment, and, uh, and you have to sit down with a little checklist and go, okay, how do I go through and troubleshoot this and decide what piece of equipment is not working properly? And it ends up being some bad my cable, and it usually is a bad my cable that was bad last time you used it. And after the session, it got rolled up and put back with the good my cables, and then it shows up somewhere else next time. And uh, there's just all these little things that you have to watch out for um, that help uh, sessions go uh, a lot easier. Um, there are a lot of problems that I've run into, um, microphone placements and, uh, and things in the studio where I'd have people come up to me and ask questions about, um, you know, I always have trouble with uh, weird phasing when I'm miking drums and, uh, you know, how can I get around that? And they try, they're trying all sorts of uh, overkill in changing mic placements and changing where in the room the drums are and, and doing what I think is too much to try to solve some of these problems where usually they're just subtle little things. You know, you can go out and move a snare drum mic a quarter of an inch and it makes a difference whether the drum sound is very bad or very good. And it's just these subtle little things because of all of the uh, sound adding from different sources into these 15 mics that you have around the drums and it becomes very critical, all these phase cancellations. So just a small amount of change in a microphone 
um, can make a big difference. Um, when you start thinking about the physics of all of this, the speed of sound uh, and uh, wavelengths, uh, a thousand cycles travels uh, 1,100 feet a second as the speed of sound, and 1,100 cycles, one wavelength is going to be a foot. So if you take uh, a microphone and move it six inches, uh, two, two microphones six inches apart are going to be out of phase at a thousand cycles. And so if you have, depending on where your guitar amps are sitting, if you have a stereo guitar amp and how far apart these microphones are and what notes he's playing, there's going to be things that are out of phase. And uh, so you can fix some of these things by just taking one of the two speaker cabinets and move it six inches and everything just completely clears up. And little things like that, and realizing how the physics of recording things works and applying that to the problems that you have can solve uh, lots of things. Um, when you have low frequency buildups, you know, the, the bass is leaking into the drums, um, you might have to move the bass uh, six feet, but you move it closer to the drums, you can, a lot of times, get rid of a lot of the problems you had where you, in your mind you're thinking, well, I'm getting too much bass in the drums, I have to move it further away and it's already against the back wall. That's not always necessarily the case. Um, and coupled with the background of, you know, the knowledge of how sound works and reflections and, and things like that with some experimentation, um, you can make almost any room work to your advantage so that you can get a good sounding recording of a, uh, a classical quart string quartet or um, a heavy metal band or a jazz recording and it almost, almost doesn't make any difference what the environment is or what kind of mics that you have to use or what kind of console that you're recording on or any of that stuff. It's just knowing enough about how each particular piece of equipment operates and using it to, uh, to the best of its ability. Um, uh, changing things in the position of the room and using the microphones that are the best matched for the particular instrument, whatever they are. It's not like, um, gee, I have to record a vocal and I've only ever used a U87 and there's no U87s at this studio, so I'm not going to be able to do a good job recording the vocal, that doesn't necessarily, um, you know, have any, have any credibility. Um, you can use whatever microphones there are and, uh, and make any recording come out well by balancing correctly the rest of the stuff that's being recorded along with it. Um, um, I've run into a lot of problems with uh, reflections off the walls in control rooms making it hard to find a little spot that sounds good between the, the near field monitors. And uh, um, knowing that sound reflects off the walls exactly at the same angles that light reflects off the walls. Um, uh, an architect told me once that after I was having a, lot, a hard time trying to figure out where, where in the room should I put the speakers, where should I put this, he said, just get one of those mirror squares you tape it up on the wall or have somebody hold it around. And if you can see the speaker in that little mirror square, then there's a reflection from that speaker coming to your ear exactly the way that you can see it, and you know that there's going to be some phase cancellation there. Right? So if you know that, you can position your little board in your project studio, you can position things around so that it's a little bit unsymmetrical. It doesn't have to be exactly in the corner or exactly parallel to one wall. It can be a little, a little askew and out a little bit. And you put the mirror squares against the wall so that you can can't see the speakers in any of these reflective points. And you turn on the speakers and play something. And you go, wow, sounds pretty good right here. And so now you've saved thousands of dollars instead of going in and trying to make a little room in your basement or your bedroom. Um, have some architect come in and design a studio and putting all these things on the walls and changing the textures just by moving things around in that room, you can get something, find the sweet spot in the room that makes your speakers sound the best and you can do a, a pretty good job of recording um, your little project stuff or whatever it happens to be um, 
with the least amount of uh, money spent. And uh, this seems to be one of the keys in you know, Project Studios. I mean, everybody's buying 8 tracks, these 8 track Tascams and ADATs, because they're a lot cheaper than a Sony 24 track digital machine or a Mitsubishi or a 48 track. Um, and uh, so you want to make the, you, you've now got a small amount of money invested in equipment that qual all audio quality wise is just as good as the bigger, more expensive pieces of equipment. So you want to try to do the same thing with your acoustic environment. And just knowing how sound works and the physics of, of that sort of thing, and there's plenty of books that you can get on this, um, uh, books on acoustics that tell you how things work and, and uh, how reflections and, and inverse square laws of how things decay with distance and uh, standing waves in rooms and things where you get enough of a knowledge about them that um, it can help you pretty much get through any kind of a recording process. Um, see, the uh, um, but I've just been sort of jumping around here. Um, uh, another thing that comes up quite often is, uh, you know, setting up levels and things on tape machines. And uh, um, with all these digital pieces of equipment, DAT machines and DA88s and uh, ADATs now, I saw at the AES show, uh, Panasonic is now doing an ADAT compatible and Sony showed their um, Tascam compatible machine, their DA88. So everybody's jumping into the 8-track market. There's billions of them. Um, you'll notice that there's no knobs on the front of the machines to set levels with. You know, So um, it's really important in a little studio environment to have standard levels throughout your system so that uh, if you need to plug in one machine as a substitute to another that all the levels match so you don't start um, chasing gain uh, by having some piece of equipment that's too loud coming out of one piece of equipment and then you have to trim down the input of some other piece of equipment then the third piece of equipment in the chain you have to turn the level way up again um, to get back to where it was coming in the first piece of equipment um, so now you have things that are clipping into one piece of equipment and the level is so low into the third piece of equipment that you're down in the noise floor of the digital domain and, and, and recording a lot of uh, console noise instead of the music that you're supposed to be recording. Um, it's really important to go through a setup of your little <coughs> console and the tape machines and uh, the mix machines, everything, and have uh, a standard levels around the whole system. Um, a lot of these machines, you can just uh, plug them in either with quarter inches or RCAs in the, in the case of the um, DA88, and they're minus 10 if you plug in one hole, or they're plus 4 if you use another hole, and uh, um, lots of other pieces of equipment have switches on the back so you can decide whether it's minus 10 levels or plus 4 levels. Um, it's, uh, and, and outputs of the little consoles like the Rollins and the Mackies and everything usually have switches or strapping jumpers or dip switches so that you can set the levels to be one way or the other. Um, it's real important that everything is the same so that you don't run into a lot of problems. And, uh, and that can really uh, snowball on you over, over a period of time. Um, Let's see. Uh, um, I, I get a lot of questions about uh, uh, equalizing to overcome pieces of equipment. Um, I've always thought that uh, the most important uh, or uh, the primary part of the recording is to get the sound of the instrument onto tape doing the least amount of compression, the least amount of EQ, the least amount of anything you can do. And so I've always tried to change something at the instrument, if at all possible, if I didn't like the way something sounds. So this means uh, if it's a drum, um, you know, change the snare drum, if, if we're talking about that, change the snare drum or change the head on the snare drum or 
tighten the head on the snare drum or loosen it or do something at the source to change the sound of the source, um, change the position of the microphone, change the microphone a little bit, um, and as a last resort, if you've tried all of that, then inside the control room you can add a little brightness or take out a little uh, mid bass or whatever is wrong, you can fix it up with a little bit of EQ and you'll find that you have to do a lot less EQing if you've taken the time to uh, uh, change the strings on the guitar or use a different acoustic guitar or the way this guy is playing that guitar doesn't work out, maybe the other guitar player in the band should play this part because of his touch is different and that happens a lot where two guys can play the same instrument and it sounds completely different because of the way that they play it. And um, uh, there's all sorts of things you can do at the source um, where a piece of uh, where the instrument is in the room because of these standing waves that we were talking about earlier um, can make a big difference in the way the re recording sounds. Uh, so even if there's an acoustic guitar player out here and you listen to it and there's something a little funny, something boomy, something muddy, um, maybe take him in his chair and move him over four feet and listen to it again with the same mic, same guitar, same player, same everything, and you go in the control room and listen to it, and now everything sounds fine, just the way all the reflections are adding up. And uh, I always try to do those things first before I do anything electronically. Um, uh, Roger, have you ever used the mirror technique for the musicians like you did with the monitoring kind of situation? Um, not, uh, you know, usually in the control rooms, uh, especially have control rooms like this that have some weird angles, it's kind of hard to like visualize without the mirror exactly what's bouncing where. Um, but uh, in usually what end up being square rooms, in uh, you know I've used something similar. I haven't used the mirrors, but in a square room you can pretty much guess where things are reflecting. Um, there's usually um, in the low frequencies stuff carries a lot further. Um, in a control room, I mean, in, out here in the room, um, low frequencies like from bass amps and things, these gobos don't stop them at all. Just go, you can have them up or not up, and it's not going to make any difference how much of the bass is leaking into the acoustic guitar or something. Um, uh, the mirror thing out here, I mean, you can use that, um, but usually you can get a pretty good, you know, billiard look at a square room. This one is a little bit harder because you've got not right angles anywhere. You know, so the mirrors might help a little bit. Um, usually in a room like this, you're dealing with a bigger room than you are the control room. Um, so the high frequency reflections aren't going to have as much to do with it because they're going to be attenuated by the distance, you know, by the time they get back. I, I was wondering if maybe you could elaborate on uh, um, how to possibly select do you have any techniques? I'll give you an example. One of the things, I've been in a lot of studios in Los Angeles, and one of the things that I, I was in one room one time that was in somebody's warehouse, it was like, he made it out of a geodesic dome inside, literally. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things I've done for myself on certain spots in the room is I'd walk around the room and just clap my hands and listen mm -hmm. for slapback and things like that. That's one thing. I was wondering if you had any other kind of techniques that would be help you to, to find a sweet spot well, you know, when that's, it's a strange shape. Which that's good too. I mean, I forgot about it. I do that too, you know, going and clap my hands or you're going whoo, 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 making noises or grunts or, you know, burping, doing something so that you can hear how things are reflecting. Um, and, uh, you know, those help a lot. Or you can, if somebody's out in the room playing, you have the musician out there, well, play the guitar a little bit or hit the drum a little bit. And you can walk around and listen and, uh, I've actually, somebody 20 years ago said to me, well, just walk out of the room and stick your finger in one ear. <laughs> I think it looked weird out there walking around and stick a finger in one ear. But it actually helps a lot because your brain cancels out a lot of these reflections and stuff and, and, and focuses you on the sound of the instrument that's happening. You go in the control room and listen and it doesn't sound the same anymore. But if you're actually in the room and you put your finger in one ear, um, all that three-dimensional information goes away, and it does sound, you listen to the snare drum out here, and then you walk in the control room, sounds exactly the same. So you can get good cues by taking some of that information your brain is canceling away, and uh, so, so I've used that a lot. You know, I mean, some room, walk around, find a spot, hitting something, or hitting a cowbell, or playing a horn, or
strumming a guitar or something, and you can find little areas that sound better than others. And uh, it works the same way with vocals and things. You know, find a place in the room that sounds the best with vocals and put up some baffles. And, and uh, I've also used these, uh, these new things that Tube Trap makes, right, that are on the mic stands. Um, those, I mean, I'm amazed how well they work. You know, I take a few of those and put them in a semicircle, like three feet apart, and uh, it just completely takes out most of the reflections in a room. Because they're unbelievable. It's impossible for them to work the way I figure it. It's <laughs> some kind of magic. You know? <laughs> it's a placebo, right? Um, but they, they did. They sent me a bunch of these things, and I went, you know, these can't work. And uh, we tried it in Donald Fagan's studio. He had, his studio wasn't done yet when we did his album. You know, they were still under construction, so we'd be out there recording and there's bare walls and not the right covering on them and there's weird reflections. And, and so we just took a bunch of these things and put them up. Let's see if these work. Put them up and Donald went out there and started singing. Wow. It's like he's outdoors. They're completely, you know, it was amazing. And then you could, they have two different sides and you could turn them around and change the characteristic of the suckness or whatever. <laughs> 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 the technical term. <laughs> the suckness. And, uh, and you could really change the sound of the room with these things. And then I used them on a couple other projects where uh, I was doing um, this album that Rodney Crowell was producing, this uh, female singer, and we did a lot of overdubs at this little studio that was used to be a house turned into a studio in Nashville. And uh, it was basically a converted living room was the where we were doing the vocals. And I just took these things out and set them around, had it right in the middle of the room, and it uh, sounded great. So. I'm sorry, what, what, what's that device called again? Um, and I suck this, I don't know. <laughs> um, I actually don't know what it's called, but it's Tube Trap makes them. Well, and, it's, it's Acoustic Sciences Corporation. And company. Oh yeah, and Tube Trap is the name of the thing. Right? But uh, I don't know what the exact name of the, but if they're on like a, a music stand bottom, like just like this, and you can, they're about this high, and then you can pull them up, you know, so that the acoustic absorbent part of them is up higher in the room, you know, uh, <coughs> level with wherever the microphone is. And they work pretty good. And I also took three of them and put them in the control room, back in the back, and it soaked up a lot of the reflections off the back wall, and uh, they worked pretty good. And they, they can be, you know, three, four feet apart, and uh, it sounds as if you have a, a whole big baffle that's solid in that three or four feet. Yeah, they're pretty amazing. Yeah? Um, in regards to the one finger technique that you had there, um, one of the things that's happening in some uh, recording situations is binaural recording where we take a mic placement and simulate where the heads are. Or, well, where the ears are on the head, I should say. Right. Have you ever used anything like that as far as picking up ambience in the room? Um, um, I've used, you know, XY mic techniques and everything. I've never used a little head with the microphones in it. Um, I, uh, what you have to be careful in that sort of thing is uh, when you are doing overdubs or you know multiple pass recordings of that sort of stuff. Um, when we're out, if if we had uh, uh, a cello and a bass and a viola and a violin out here and everybody's playing at once, this room is only in the picture once. Even though you have multiple microphones, this, this basic ambience only happens once in that recording. So if you're doing uh, the violin, one person's doing it all. Does the cello part, and then does the viola part, and then does this part, and then does that part, and you're doing it with this binaural head. So all of a sudden you have five rooms, and that's unnatural. And I've run across people who have done recordings like that. Well, you know, I have this great setup, and this is absolutely perfect. And Listen how this violin sounds. You listen to it, it sounds absolutely fine. Listen how this cello sounds absolutely fine. But when you add them all together, it doesn't work. Yeah. Well, that kind of works in reverse of how you set up drums then. I mean, because you do it all at, the, all at the same time. I watched right. you set up drums, and instead of soloing every drum, you listen to the whole set. But I'm only and listening then, to the room once. Yeah, it's only one environment. Saying, so 
right? Everything is uh, coherent as far as the environment is going. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's really hard to, de um, I found a long time ago when you're getting a drum sound that uh, you solo the snare drum and you spend however much time it takes to get the perfect snare drum sound. That's the only time it's gonna be perfect is when it's solo, right? As soon as you turn on the rest of the mics, so, um, I always get my drum sound by um, just pulling up all the mics and then with, with the mics in sort of the proper perspective, um, work on the snare drum sound, you know. And then if there's too much leakage or something, I might then modify some of the other microphones that are feeding the mess to get rid of some of that leakage or put a piece of foam rubber between something or whatever I have to do. But the basic finished recording is going to have all those mics in there. So um, there might be something that you need to solo the snare drum, you know, just to hear what its contribution is, or solo the kick drum, just figure out what its contribution is to this, this thing. And, uh, but yeah, I always try to, and it ends up a lot faster for me. You know, it takes um, 15 minutes to get a drum sound just by turning them all up. The guy's playing, I have him hit each drum once, you know and uh, keep going around and then I'd make little changes or change levels or change pans or whatever I need to do. Go out there, um, change the microphone position, come back in and uh, um, do it like that. But yeah, it does help to have everything that's contributing to the picture in all at once. Um, uh, just like when you're doing you know, photography, you have all the lights on so you can see what the overall thing is then because of some reflection, you might solo just one light to see how, if that's where the reflection is coming from or whatever it is, right? And then modify that thing and then go back to the whole picture. But, uh, so yeah, you, so you gotta be very careful about this, you know, the binaural head or recording things with ambience with these X, Y microphones or whatever, if you're gonna do um, overdub type situations. But, uh, but if you could, you know, my favorite, um, uh, I do string sections now, 40 piece orchestras with the uh, Calrec sound field. Um, and not even have, so it's a, a microphone that has, I think there's six capsules in it, and then there's a little control box. And by changing with the little control box, you can have the microphone sitting up here and go in the control room and listen. And you close your eyes and you can actually change the position of the microphone in the room by turning these knobs. And you're basically changing the phase relationship and how much it's added into this matrix of these capsules. And so when the string section is playing and I'm not getting enough of the violas, I can just turn this knob and the microphone will sound like I just moved it closer <coughs> over to the violas. And uh, because now I don't have 32 microphones all mixed together, all that phasing stuff is gone. Um, I just have this basically single point um, stereo uh, sensor that's picking up the whole room. And uh, I did uh, a, f a few John Denver albums like that with just one mic, 40 piece orchestra. Um, the first time I did it though, I had thousands of other microphones around <laughs> just in case it didn't work. But uh, you know, it worked out great, and then this, this project that I did with uh, Rodney Crowell and this, this girl singer, um, um, they were sweating, but I knew it worked, right? And so they came in and went, where's all the microphones? Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> but these, these 40 guys, this is costing us like 11 billion dollars to do this, right? And, uh, but it came out great. It sounded like, you know, yeah. Can you, can you adjust that after the fact? Yeah. yeah, if you record, so it has, there's four signals come in from the microphone head. And if you record it on four tracks, then you can feed it back into this matrix box and change it after the fact. Um, after a few times of doing it that way, um, I didn't need to do that anymore. I knew what I wanted and I could adjust it when they were running down the string part and then just record it on two tracks and be done with it. Um, I like to sort of nail things down like that um, so there's fewer choices to make when it comes time to mix. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the used on a drum set? <coughs> um, I never used it on a drum set. Um, because drums are so loud, um, um, I've always had better, for me, better 
uh, luck getting drum sounds with the close miking. Um, one thing I have, you know, multiple close miking. Um, one of the things I have done is um, a lot of people use a microphone underneath the snare drum to get more of the snare sound when they want to add it in. But there's always this, um, uh, it's you know basically out of phase to start with because it's on the bottom and the other one's on the top. And I started using a shotgun mic um, above the head of the drummer aiming down at the snare drum. And so it sort of envelops the whole snare drum and gets the sound of the shell and the bottom and the snares and everything. So I started using that instead of a bottom mic on the snare drum. And uh, um, I've sometimes taken that and to make up for the delay, moved it earlier so that it's exactly in phase with the signal coming up from the snare drum. And uh, I've got real nice, crisp uh, snare drum sounds with using a minimal amount of EQ. Um, with the digital recorders with DA88s and the ADATs, you can shift tracks earlier. Or the ADAT, you have to shift all the rest of them later. The DA88, you can take one track and shift it earlier. The Sony dash machines, you can take any track and shift it uh, um, later when you're bouncing it to another track. Um, or you can take it off onto a computer and shift it earlier and put it back on or something. But, uh, but that's really helped a lot in uh, drum sounds that I've gotten by doing that. Um, I've, yeah, I've never used that one thing on a, on a drum set. Um, so uh, uh, another thing that I've run across is um, uh, overuse of effects. Uh, you know, using limiters too much. Um, so as, as I'm talking about as a basic concept, you know, if there's some sound that you want, you know, this guitar, I don't want it to sound like a guitar, I want it to sound like a, uh, you know, a cat being beat with a two by four or something, right? Um, so there's things that you have to do to get that because it's not a normal sound for a guitar. And there's nothing wrong with using one of these special effects boxes or having a limiter that the needle just pegs down at zero or it's taped there or something. <laughs> so, um, so there's nothing wrong with doing that to, to achieve a particular um, special effect. But as a, as, a, as a starting point, it's real easy to listen to one particular instrument and go, yeah, it sounds really cool when it's limited a lot like that. Or listen how present that vocal is when the limiter's on 12 to 1 and the needle's going down to minus 20. You know, that sounds really cool. But it doesn't really fit as part of the puzzle um, anymore. And... Uh, um, there's always a tendency to have too much reverb on things. Um, when you have one particular thing soloed and you listen to the reverb and you can, you're listening to the detail in the back of the reverb and it's big and nice and you go, wow, that sounds really great. But when you have other instruments that are masking those things that you thought were so neat, um, all you have left is the, what ends up being the ugliness of that reverb, you know, that, that pretty much is going to um, wash out everything. And, uh, and I've run into a lot of people who I've gone over to the little project studios to look at them or and they're, you know, listen to this, what I did, or listen to this, and they play any things, and there's just tons of echo boinging. It sounds like a spring reverb in the back of a 57 Chevy, right? <laughs> um, yeah, I keep waiting for the sound when you used to drive over the railroad tracks, and it would go boing, boing, boing. <laughs> Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's important, especially when you're starting to build this recording or build this mix, you know, you, you get the sound that you want on the reverb and then turn it down until you almost can't hear it. And uh, then when you do that on all of the things that you have reverb on, all these different uh, multi-effects processors, turn it down until you almost can't hear it. Now listen to the whole thing together and start turning up the guitar and turn up the piano and get everything so you can hear all the parts happening. And then, if you want a little bit more reverb or something on the guitar, then you can touch it up a little bit. But just s try to stay with this minimal attitude to at least get the balances between all the instruments and get a starting point. You know, then if you wanted to go 
crazy on one particular thing or you know go up from there but it's 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 really hard after you get used to you know your mind starts tuning out the bad stuff for a while right so so you hear this reverb and you go ah oh, that's really cool and you leave it on there for a while and pretty soon your mind starts blocking it out so you don't notice it anymore um, and then uh, pretty soon you've you know run up some box canyon where it's hard to when you start turning it off it sounds like it's missing and it's a long way away from gone. Yeah? Have you found that the reverb, uh, uh, when you do that on independent channels like that, you know, in the mix, does it, does it affect your imaging quite a bit? Well, um, yeah, most of the, most of the reverbs are, are basically, you know, fake stereo. They're, uh, they have different time delays, especially, you know, these little digital units that you're using and stuff. There's different time delays to one channel as the other. And, um, yeah, it sort, of, it sort of sucks everything more into the middle. Um, there's very few uh, true stereo uh, reverb units. One of them is, it used to be the Ibanez that then became the Sony MUR201. Um, you know, it's a little one rack high um, Sony reverb uh, that has a little display in the middle and a bunch of buttons on the right. SRB2000? Excuse me? SRB2000? No, no, no. That one. Oh, that's a Roland. I'm yeah, that's a Roland. Um, so, so the Sony unit is called the MUR201, and it's a true stereo. You can you can be listening to just the return of the reverb, and if you pan the sand over to the left, you'll hear that instrument over to the left part of the stage. The delays and stuff on the left will be shorter. The delays on the right will sound longer, as if somebody was over on the left side of the stage. And you pan the sand over to the right, and you, sit, you can hear it move across the stage. And so you have big stage presence, and it's actually a stereo reverb. Um, the Sony does it. Um, I can't remember whether the new Sony processors. Um, I'm not even tied to anything. Um, no, I, haven't, I haven't really run across anything like that in the eventide. I was actually, what I was referring to was during the mix process, you've got all these channels and all these signal levels, and you want some reverb here and some reverb there. And um, it's, to me, it just, I, don't, I haven't actually done it that way, but I was, I was curious if you had any experience. It seems that when you start increasing the overall average level coming from one signal to another, the placement's much harder in the field because you've got such a broad band of information that's coming mm -hmm. in, and it's yeah. not so it's not so deep defined. And right. So I would my personal tendency is to wait till the very last thing and then add in the reverb on the stereo as the mm -hmm. whole piece comes across. That's well, so I mean that's that's possible too. Uh, you know, it's a matter of taste of when you want to do it. But you know it helps that if you don't have a lot of it on there. I mean, you have a little bit of ambience to add some three-dimensionalness to the sound. Um, there's a problem if you just have one reverb unit. You have a Rev Seven, and everything that you want to have reverb on has to go to the Rev Seven. Then this sort of adds to the imaging problem of everything is feeding the same sounding reverb, and and it just sort of mushes things up. Um, those imaging problems. Um, you can help the imaging by using different reverbs for different things. You know, so you use the the Sony on a vocal, and you use uh, the Rev Seven on an acoustic guitar, and then you have some other little thing that somebody brings over, you know, the Roland or something um, that you use on something else. And uh, the difference in the quality of their individual sounds will help improve the imaging quite a bit, as opposed to just having one one effects processor that everything is feeding. But, uh, and, and this is part of why I said uh, you should keep it all down, you know, and then, and then if you want to go crazy on something, turn it up, you know, uh, for, on one particular thing or something. But um, if you should try to keep the stuff at a minimum to make sure that you get the positioning that you want, but you also need to have some of it in there because if you do, if you don't have echo on anything, and then at the end you add it up, this nice position that you had is going to partly go away, right? So if you have some of that information that is clouding it up, 
if that if that information needs to be in there, maybe uh, at that point you'll have to pan the guitar further over to the left to make it come out where you want because of this, you know, underlying echo and stuff. Yes. But if you had those different acoustic instruments in an acoustic <coughs> space, they would all have one reverb, wouldn't they? If they'd be coming from different spots in the room. Um, you, mean like, you mean like everybody playing at once with one micro one stereo microphone kind of thing? Is that um, yeah, but you're you're also dealing with uh, the space that they're playing in, and if everything's perfect, um, they're they're also you know the, the musicians play to their environment, you know. So so here you have a room acoustics where the guitar player hears the room acoustics that he's playing in, and, and uh, you know the cello player and the horn. I mean whatever's going on, everybody hears that and plays to what they hear. Just like when they're doing overdubs, it's real important that you have a very good mix. The better the mix, the easier it is for the guy to play and uh, figure out what to play and how to play it and everything because he's hearing in context how things are going to be. Um, if you are, there's absolutely no <coughs> reverb, everybody's listening in earphones, isolated in little cubicles, and they're playing the parts, and then you're adding the reverb later, um, you don't have the advantage of the musician playing to what the final um, ambience is going to be. You know, so it becomes a little bit harder, and it does sort of cloud up the issue a little bit. You know, it just uh, you're now you know trying to you're fighting things a little bit to try to recreate you know to create something that wasn't there and make it work, and it becomes you know pretty hard to do. So sometimes it takes a long time of trying a whole bunch of different algorithms to find something that that does what you want, adds a little ambience that wasn't there and doesn't distract from the part that was played and how it meshes with everything else. And I mean, there's you know, hundreds of different ways to do things. Um, the best way would be if everybody would just sit out here, play, it's done. You don't have to do any overdubs. You go home and two weeks later go down to the tower and buy it. Um, yeah? What if you're not in that situation? What if you're in your home studio? You want, say you're a string section, but you don't have 40 of them, you just have two or three or four of you, and you want it to sound like you're 100, you know. How would you go about creating that? Um, well, I, I would first try to, in that case, you, I think you have to get rid of as much of the ambience as you can in each one of those passes, right? So there's four of you, you're going to have to make 10 passes to be 40. So um, I would, uh, Try to deaden things up so all I got was the sound of the instruments. Could you close um, mic it? Excuse me? Could you close mic it? Um, yeah, I'd pretty close mic it. Yeah, I would close mic it. And um, I would try. Uh, <clears throat> there's this phenomenon of the same exact instrument being played more than once. Um, you know, there's every Stradivarius is a little bit different, right? So when you have, you know, um, Ten guys playing the violins at one time. It doesn't sound. It sounds better than one guy playing the same violin ten times, right? Because of the inflections of the way the guy plays, because of the sound of that particular instrument and the overtones of it, and because it's usually the guy didn't move it. It's the same place in the room each pass. Um, so I would, uh, if you have to use exactly the same instrument each time, um, knowing that you know I should change the way I'm doing it just a little bit to, to make it a little bit different each pass. I should move to a different place in the room, move over, sit in this chair, do one pass, sit in this chair, do the next pass, sit in this chair, so those little ambient reflections add up differently. Um, um, if, uh, if these four guys can play each other's instruments, you know, then I, you, know, you would play the violin on one pass, and then you would play his viola on the next pass, and he would play your violin, and you can do that sort of things to mix things up and it'll sound much more like the 40 pieces that you were intending to do um, after it's all over with, you know. Um, you can do little things like uh, um, tune, tune a little higher VSO of the machine up a little bit, right? So that these overtone series move just a little bit so they don't exactly mesh with the overtones when everything was done at the right speed at, at the initial tuning and stuff. You know, so there's all these little things you can do to make things work better. Um, uh, 
one of my favorite synthesizer keyboard players is Robbie Buchanan, and he comes from a classical background, and he's very good at coming up with synthesizer sounds that sound like strings, and he knows how, um, how strings uh, are articulated. So he doesn't play them like a keyboard player would play those parts, block, block chords and things. You know, he knows where the movement of the violas over the, ch you know, and the cellos and the violins and all those string lines are written. And so he would, he would do most of those things, and we would have like one guy come in and play one viol real violin over top of this keyboard synth synthesized string section. And just that other overtone information that you're getting from a real instrument mixed in with the, even though he's playing the same part that's already on there with the keyboards, right? Just this one thing, all of a sudden your ears are fooled and you go, wow, that's a real 40-piece string section, isn't that? It? It's not synthesizer strings. Because there's these, these little tricks that he's learned over the years. And, uh, or sometimes, without having a guy come in, he would have, you know, um, a sampler that has a very good recording of a single violin, and he would do all the synthesizer stuff and then make another pass that's just this one sampled violin playing parts of it. And these things all mixed together that are different things create the illusion of it's, you know, a, a real string section. And so there's a lot of it is experimentation and, uh, you know, figuring out what's, what's going to sound right in, in your particular case. You know, you, you might have to do it ten times, you know, take the four guys, record them ten times, and listen back to them and you go, boy, this doesn't, is not making it. There's something, something wrong with this. You know, let's do some experimenting and try it again. And if it's, you know, home studio, uh, and they're all your friends, you know, and you're all getting together and trying to do this, and everybody wants to do the best, then you can afford to spend this extra time to try something. You know, this is okay, let's see if we can do something better. Let's get to put on another piece of tape, try these ten passes, and mess around, do something else, do one of them in the bathroom, one of them in the kitchen, one of them here, one of them there, um, change around and, and, and do those sort of things and see what works out. And then you'll come up with some little formula, wow, this always works pretty cool, let's try this next time. You know, so those are part of the, the cool things about having a little home studio that you can afford to do that experimenting where at, you know, $250, $400 an hour in some big expensive studio, you can't really do that. You know, so, um, uh, and, and luckily in, in the stuff that I've been able to do, um, I've been able to learn from the experience of uh, musicians that have come in to play on things where they in the past have tried some of these things at home or tried some of these things, you know, and they, they would say to me, well, hey, Roger, uh, let's try this. I tried this over at so-and-so session the other day and it worked pretty good, right? And you go, okay, so you try something and then you learn by his, you know, 700 hours of messing around. In, in, in an hour, you learn, you know, everything he's had to put into this particular thing. You know? And uh, so, um, I've been pretty lucky that the, the guys that I've worked with over the years have been, you know, the top musicians who have, who have spent billions of hours in the studio and uh, um, learned how to tune their drums and, you know, uh, had thousands of different people placing mics on them and come up with some combination where they go, oh, so-and-so used this microphone over here like this and I was standing with one leg and, and I go, oh, okay, well, let's try that. <laughs> Um, so, uh, there were some other questions over here, so, yes? As of late, uh, have you found that there were any, I think I have two questions, actually. Do you think that you found any particular microphones that you're very fond of? And the other question is, a lot of people have been buying lots of tube equipment as of late. Mm -hmm. What is your approach uh, to develop or, or trying to get that warm type sound? Well, uh, on the first question, um, microphones, you know, um, I mean, there's lots of new good microphones coming out. And, uh, you know, my new, my favorite company right now is Audio Technica. I think they're coming out with a lot of new stuff that's really inexpensive mm -hmm. and, uh, and good. You know, I've used, what was it, the, uh, 
the 4033, I guess, is their um, um, uh, cardioid uh, big capsule vocal mic. And uh, I used it for a Roseanne Cash album. I used it on a Rodney Crowell album. And I pretty much, uh, it's a toss up that and a TLM 170. I think they sound close enough um, that, uh, you know, I basically don't care which one I use. And uh, I've used their, they have a, a, a big capsule dynamic called, I think it's the AT25 that uh, I used on the Steely Dan tour on the kick drum on uh, uh, Dennis Chambers' drum set um, for live. And, uh, and it, it was really great. Um, and I've always had trouble finding good uh, kick drum mics. Um, uh, a few years ago, I discovered these uh, Yamaha dynamic microphones that I wrote about um, called the... So there, when, I, when I saw the sheet on them, um, I, I've noticed when I do record drums, there's certain places where I would, you know, boy, this sounds almost perfect with no EQ, I'd just go, just a little bit right here, just a little bit right there. And I saw the curves on these microphones, and they had these beryllium capsules, and the beryllium capsules resonated right exactly where I would goose up a little bit of high end EQ. Right? And uh, so I called up somebody I knew at Yamaha, and I said, you know, send me over some of these to try. Um, these might work out pretty good. So they sent me a bunch of them over, and I put them on Peter Erskine drums for a Ricky Lee Jones album. And uh, went in the control room and I didn't have to reach down to touch the knob. Uh, ah, cool. <laughs> so I didn't have to use any EQ at all. They just had the right amount of brightness in the right spot. And there were two different, these two different microphones. They're different sizes with different size capsules. And the curves, the little peak on the big microphone, which must be the 204 is the big one, um, was just down a little bit lower. And uh, so I would use those on the big drums, like the kick drum and the tom-toms and uh, the low toms. And I'd use the little ones, which the peak was up a little higher. I'd use that on the snare drum and the higher toms. And uh, it worked out great. So those are basically my favorite drum mics. And I use them all the time. And uh, the Audio-Technica, the 4051, um, for a, a long time ago, gee, uh, 20 years ago, I had this little cheap Sony Electret uh, condenser microphone that I used on hi-hat because it would never break up. And they discontinued, I don't even remember the number of it now, they discontinued it, somebody stole mine, and then for years I've been trying to find something that I liked good on a hi-hat. Um, and then uh, I stumbled across this, this Audio-Technica, the 4051. Um, I use it on hi-hat all the time now because it will not break up, no matter how close you put it, no matter how high hard he hits the hi-hat. Um, it sounds you know, nice and uh, three-dimensional for this one mic, and so I use that for that. And I also have used it on acoustic guitars with uh, the hypercardioid capsule. So I think it has a different number, you know, they've got 40, 51, 52, and 53 or something, and I think it's just which capsule, whether it's uh, omnicardioid or hypercardioid. So I usually use the hypercardioid capsule. And I've used it on acoustic guitars with Dean Parks and, and uh, um, Rodney Crowell, and it sounds pretty good. Um, let's see, I like, I like the TLM 170 a lot. Um, uh, what else? Um, the shotgun mics that I use uh, are the Audio Technica, real nice and clean. It seems like the last few years of these new mics that Audio Technica is coming out with um, are really nice and really clean. And uh, I hope nobody tells them that they're worth more than they're charging for them. You know, that's like something's wrong with that company for a while. You know, getting I had just bought good. a couple of these 4033s and mm -hmm. had a Occasion to use them in a couple of open studios and was absolutely floored by the way this microphone performed. And, mm -hmm. and I've been used to using the sevens and all right. that type of thing. So I hear where you're coming from. Um, so uh, the tube stuff, um, you know, I think that 
there's a back up to uh, when there was just analog recording. Um, you know, there's a physics of what happens when you record on analog tape is that by the time you've played it back two or three times, what you recorded isn't there anymore. And no amount of noise reduction, no amount of anything is going to change that. The little particles, it's like a drawing with a fountain pen on newspaper. It just sort of spreads out and there's nothing you can do about it. The, the particles, um, their uh, magnetic alignment is related to the particles next to it and it spreads out just like ink on a piece of newspaper. And uh, um, so when you record analog, um, just because that's the way you've always recorded, you would start compensating for that. You make the snare drum a little bit too bright and this a little bit too bright and change these things, make them a little bit too bright so that after a few days of playing it back, it sounds like you thought it should sound. Um, is what would always happen to me in the studio is when it came time to mix, you'd put up the basic track, the drums you know, that you hadn't heard since you cut the tracks. Um, you've been doing overdubs for a few weeks or whatever it is, now you, all of a sudden you back time to mix, you put up the drums and bass and the acoustic piano and acoustic guitar and just those, the basic rhythm things. And somebody would inevitably say, boy, I could have sworn that the track sounded tighter and crisper than that when we cut it. That's because it did. And so now you have to go back to compensating for uh, what's extra loss has happened since you EQ'd it too much in the recording process. Um, so these things that are ingrained into you, years of recording, that this is the way I, you know, here's the snare drum, yank, yank, a little bit extra here, yank, yank, a little bit extra on the acoustic guitar. Now digital recording comes along, um, Gee, I've been recording the guitar this way for 20 years, eh, eh, crank that up, but now it doesn't decay anywhere. So all of a sudden, these digital recordings, the first complaints about them, gee, they're too crispy, you know, and too sizzly on the top. That's because you're recording things the way you always did, but it doesn't, it doesn't soften over time. It just stays there like that. And it's taken a long time for a lot of people to realize that and start modifying how they record stuff on tape. Um, so you can you can make things sound warm and nice on on digital recordings by uh, recording properly for that medium. You know, make it sound the way that you want, make it sound warm with EQ or room ambience or whatever. And then you put that on a piece of digital tape and you play it back later and it sounds nice and warm and Cute and uh, <laughs> um, so I think there's an o you know an over reaction to what happens recording digitally because of what I was just talking about and um, so people are leaning more toward well I don't want to I always record that way so uh, but it doesn't it doesn't hurt as much if I use a tube preamp on my guitar or a tube a tube microphone or tubes in here or tube limiter or something because of the different harmonic structure of tube equipment versus transistorized equipment um, that sort of mellows out some of the stuff that you're doing and sort of softens the blow of the too much EQ you use and, uh, and I think that's a lot of it. Um, there are particular times, uh, particular vocals uh, when I worked on a Frank Sinatra record with uh, um, Quincy Jones and uh, um, those guys uh, a few years ago, um, and Phil Ramone, Phil Ramone was the engineer, Quincy Jones, Jones was the producer, and I did the second engineering. Everybody like took a step down to work on this project, and uh, um, we tried a whole bunch of different microphones for uh, for Frank Sinatra, and the tube microphone sounded the best. And I think it was just because of the harmonics in his voice and the harmonics that were added by the microphone just all added up nicely, and that was the most pleasing, warm sound. Um, there's other people that I've worked with where, um, you know, the, the tube microphone made things sound a little muddier, you know. Um, 
and uh, uh, a TLM 170 or this 4033 or something worked out the best and made it sound the warmest for that particular um, uh, occasion. So I think that you can't make a blanket statement about about uh, you know tube stuff always warms things up and is always going to make things sound better. Um, it's just like any other tool. There's some places where they work and some places where they don't work, and and um, you just have to look at all the the cause and effects of what's happening in recording, and a lot of it is because you know if, if you haven't heard so much about uh, tube microphones until all the digital recording, and now everybody's going, well, I have to go back to tube stuff to warm up all this digital crap, you know? and uh, so there's a uh, this whole learning process that everybody has to go through to figure out you know what actually is going to work and there's ways to not use tube microphones i don't use very many tube microphones and uh and i think a lot of my jazz albums that i've done with walter and stuff sound nice and warm and, and uh pleasant to listen to um and i didn't need to use a lot of tube stuff to do it question back then uh not to go that guy's too far from the subject of hand but uh, i know this album uh the french not the Percy jones album and playing with it. Uh, how much time did Frank actually give you to experiment with, with microphone sounds? Well, uh, any at all? <laughs> we got, average was one and a half takes per tune, right? He would come in and do, you know, uh, Mac the Knife or something. He, so we'd come in, we'd come in at 11, rehearse the orchestra, you know, the band and everything, get them all going. Frank would show up about 5.30, I guess, right? And uh, then he'd walk out there, he'd sing the song once, if Quincy talked really nice, he could talk him into starting to do it a second time. He might, if he was having a good time, he might make it all the way through the song a second time. But you had to have it the first time. You might not get it all the way through. And most of the time, he'd you know get to the second verse or something. He goes, uh, yeah, that's enough. Uh, let's do the next song, all right? And he'd do the next song, one or two takes maybe, and then he'd be gone for the evening, all right? That'd be the end of that. The next day, the same sort of thing. So um, there was a uh, prop, you know, we had to decide what mic to use um, during the, you know, the first half of the first tune on the first day. <laughs> <laughs> so there was, so there was, until he realized that we had like, you know, four microphones up there for a minute. And uh, we ended up using that, uh, matter of fact, I went out and, and and bought it just for that, uh, that gold AKG tube mic. Because um, I had heard it, you know, I, I recognized how his voice sounded. Yeah, that one right there. Um, so, you know, I, I heard, um, you know, somebody else I worked with had a, a voice that had the same timbre quality, and I had rented one of those two mics to use, and I liked the way it sounded. So during our break, I went across. Broadway and went over and I bought bought it myself to bring over and use and plugged it up and we had like three microphones sitting there for a few minutes until they went, well, what are all these microphones doing here, right? <laughs> <laughs> and by then, by then Phil Remote had figured out which one he liked and it was the gold tube mic and we took down the other ones. Oh, sorry, you know, we were just testing my phone. Took down the other ones. And that was the same night, you know, they were filming the whole thing too, right? And, uh, um, about halfway through one of the songs, Frank went, uh, so this light up here that was shining in his eyes, uh, somebody got to turn that light out or do I have to shoot it out? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a, um, a favorite room that I've heard before. It's in Los Angeles. I think um, Alan Sides owns it now at Ocean Way. It used to be United Western Studio mm -hmm. A. I think Frank's enough to record there, too. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, in your experience, have you had any rooms that you prefer for like vocals? You know, how much influence? Because most of the vocals that I've seen recorded are very, you know, fairly close to the mic. So, have you seen any effect of rooms on the, the vocals? Oh yeah, like you can really hear it because now you just have one uh, source of sound, the vocal, and the the microphone. I mean, like I can hear. All this room happening in here, right? Um, the microphone's picking all that up even more than I can sense it because it's not uh, doesn't have any DSPs to take any of the the bad stuff out. So uh, the room, yeah, affects the vocal a lot. And um, there are rooms that I like. I, I like that 
that studio over there uh, at United Western, that big Studio A. Um, I, I like uh, the old Motown studios in, in uh, Hollywood that ended up being Soundworks West and now it's Signet or something. And uh, I like uh, the Village Studio D. It's pretty nice for doing vocals because it was an odd shaped room, it wasn't square or anything. Um, where else? Uh, uh, the old record plant on 3rd Street. They had a nice sounding room for doing vocals. Have you noticed seeing in the commonalities about the rooms, maybe the construction or things that were seen similar about the rooms that would affect the vocals consistently? Well, part of it is they were either big or kind of on the dead side, I guess. You know, so that the amount of acoustics uh, in the <coughs> microphone is minimal. Um, uh, what amazed me about that Studio A was that the room was so huge and yet it was just so open sound and natural. It wasn't, didn't sound like you were in a warehouse. It was, you know, it was just a very even, well mixed room. I don't know how else to say it. it just uh -huh. it sounded so and that's smooth. that's partly because of the uh, um, the ratios of the uh, dimensions of the room. You know, there's uh, uh, formulas that you can use to figure out what is the most uh, pleasing, you know, they've been, been building uh, uh, acoustic, before there was electrical instruments, right, they've been building acoustic halls for a thousand years, and, uh, and there's some pretty nice sounding ones, you know, and so there's, there's ways to, to figure that stuff out. What happens mostly in the bad studios is you have a room that uh, the real estate costs you a billion dollars a square foot, and by then, you have to use every square foot of this concrete enclosure, you know. Um, so it's really hard to go ahead and put walls in it and, and waste a bunch of space to make it the right acoustic proportions. And uh, so a lot of times that doesn't happen. Um, it's hard to find uh, uh, architects who are also acousticians. Um, the guys who did this uh, um, this control room, uh, no, it was the, the control room over at uh, uh, bad animals, right? Where the uh, studio Bhutan, those guys, um, they did uh, Soundworks West, they did uh, Record Plant, they did uh, Walter Becker's home studio. Um, uh, these guys have degrees in acoustics, and so they can walk in and go, um, okay, this wall needs to be one degree further over this way, and that's a, uh, this wall needs to be three inches further that way. And uh, every place they've done, you walk into it and it just sounds amazing sounding because um, where a lot of other guys have finally learned but through trial and error of uh, well you know gee this didn't quite work out huh? this didn't quite work out and they write those things down in the next studio they don't do that they try some <laughs> other thing right and uh, after 500 rooms you know I could start making studios sound pretty good <laughs> and uh, but uh, you know the, the acoustics play a lot you know, have a lot to do with it. And back when um, these guys were building these studios, uh, and most of them, like the old Motown studios and the, those studios, they, they were built a long time ago. They were built in the, uh, you know, the 40s, 50s, 60s, where um, they had people that knew about acoustics would plan out, you know, how things how things were. One of the best sounding studios I ever worked in is the RCA studio in. Uh, um, Montreal. Um, it was built back when uh, you know they were recording on wax discs, right, and yelling into megaphones to do the recording. And uh, uh, at some point, when when in the 50s it was closed down, and RCA was building satellites in the in that room. And then some people went in there and un didn't even know it used to be a studio. And it was just a big open space, and they bought the place, and we're going to build a studio in there. So it was had all this uh, false ceiling in there and false walls. Um, they started tearing that stuff down, and up above there, this is beautiful um, convex rosewood panels and all this uh, um, acoustic uh, paneling that was up in the ceilings and in the walls and they tore it all down and then they started doing some research and they found out this was the original RCA 
acoustic recording studio. And so instead of ruining any of that, they basically built a little building in one corner that became the control room. And so this out here was basically intact. And it was had amazing, without any baffles or anything, there was amazing isolation between different parts of the room. And uh, just all from the way these reflectors were designed and the acoustics was built into the room. Yeah. Uh, do you think that there'll be in the future more studios in which uh, the control room is in the live room with the musicians and uh, for home studio, people that operate home studios in which that's the case? Um, can, what are some of the special considerations um, for that type of situation? Well, uh, there, there was a studio in Nashville called Soundstage with Jimmy Bowen, who was you know, a big producer, one of, you know, the biggest producer and record mogul, I guess, in Nashville. Um, and he cranks out about 30 albums a year. And uh, um, he had this studio built that the SSL console was in the room with all the musicians. And so when you cut tracks, everybody had headphones on and you cut tracks. And, Everybody's like sitting around in your living room, and that worked out well for a while, and then finally the novelty wore off, and they put a wall there. But uh, it was nice for a couple of reasons having a big control room when you're just doing control room stuff, that you didn't have close walls um, messing with the sound, even from the near field speakers. Um, there was this big open space behind the console, uh, you know, or in front of the console. Um, that part was really nice. Um, there was uh, a little bit of problems, you know, having a bunch of people in there and doing overdubs and people keeping quiet and, you know, um, uh, and that I think was why they finally put the wall in and, and isolated, all isolated it so you could be in here, you know, talking about how horrible the guy was without him <laughs> sitting right there next to you. Um, so, um, but but it can work out, and it worked out for for you know five years or something. They used it like that in a professional environment, and uh, um, in a home studio, um, it can work out. I mean, uh, I built a little home studio for my wife, and, uh, and she has you know guitar players and singers and people over there, and all the machines are in there. And you just have to be you know careful about noisy things, you know, screeching bad bearings and fans on amplifiers and, um, uh, you know, uh, everybody has to be cognizant of it and keep quiet, you know, it's like really hard to keep something quiet. That, uh, to really do critical monitoring, if let's say you're recording drums, that there'd just be too much bleed through headphones and you have um, to go back and listen to it. Well, it's, uh, you pretty, yeah, you probably have to go back and listen to it, um, but, um, that's the trade-off. I mean, it's like, you know, a lot easier to just uh, uh, record some drums, back it up, listen to it, make sure everything's okay without the guy playing next to you. Um, uh, that's uh, a lot easier than spending another $10,000 to add a room on and putting the glass in between you and the, the other musicians. I mean, it all works, you know. Um, I think that I think that, uh, uh, you know, if I had a, uh, an album to do and I didn't have very much of a budget, you know, I mean, there was actually some money to do the album, but not very much, um, I would try to budget it so that I could go into a real studio to cut the tracks, then transfer it over to my ADATs or DA88s, go home. Um, do the overdubs, fix little things, do whatever I had to do for however long it took to do it, where I could leisurely spend the time and uh, and get the best overdubs. All the overdubs are done, then bring the stuff back to a real studio where everything could be locked up all at once and a professional control room where the environment is completely controlled and do my mixing in there. So then um, I might be spending, you know, 600 to 2,000 a day or whatever it is in a studio cutting tracks and at the end mixing, uh, but I'm spending, you know, $7.50 a day at home um, doing all the overdubs. So now 
uh, I basically have a hundred thousand dollar album that I did for you know ten thousand um, dollars because I was able to not spend spend anything in the studio for the part that takes the longest, which is doing all those little overdubs and fixing things. Um, question. Do you see that a lot with uh, a lot of these digital home machines and stuff, where people are cutting tracks at home and taking me to a studio to fix them and mix on them, and <coughs> vice versa, cutting tracks in a studio and going home and adding overdubs? And how well do you think a lot of the results you've seen come out of using that? Well, um, the best results are like I, you know, the scenario that I said here where the guys have, and I've heard a lot of those things, where you cut the tracks in the real studio where you have the, you know, the expensively designed rooms that are the best for the acoustics and, and done all of that. Um, you know, if you're doing, it's all drum machines and sequence synthesizers and stuff, you don't have to do that because it's basically all electronic transfers over to your machines and you can do those kind of tracks at home. You know, I'm talking about if you want to do uh, an acoustic drummer and, you know, acoustic guitar and all these guys playing live together and the, and the feeling of all the musicians doing it, um, that uh, seems to work out better if the tracks are done at the real studio and then any overdubs and things done at home. Um, I've heard some stuff that's pretty good that's all sequenced and sample cell drums and this and that, you know, all done electronically and all done in the project studio. And then uh, um, when it comes time to mix, so you do nothing in the real studio until it's time to mix. And then you go in there and you have the benefit of having, you know, a, a million dollars worth of uh, reverb units and all these different limiters and things where you can fine tune the stuff that you couldn't quite do at home. And uh, if you're doing all this digitally, um, you've got more leeway, right? You've got a bigger um, uh, dynamic range to deal with, uh, so you can actually get away with doing something on tape without limiting it, um, and then and then use the you know expensive limiters that they have at the at the real studio for mixing, and uh, without having to worry about bringing the noise level up because you're limiting something. Where in analog recording, um, if the dynamic range of something was too wide, um, you better limit it while you're recording, or else it's going to be um, saturating the tape when it's too hot to down in the noise floor of the tape when it's too low. And uh, you don't have those problems with uh, digital recording because you've got you know an extra 50 dB of dynamic range. Yeah, all the way to the back. back. <laughs> Go ahead. I was afraid that was Before his arm falls off. <laughs> uh, two questions. One on monitoring levels. What works best for you, and do you have any special ways of metering, especially with digital, to make sure that you're seeing digital zero appear on the meters when it peaks out? Um, so monitoring levels, um, I, I don't, I try not to monitor loud, you know, so I'd say um, uh, 85 dB is about as loud as I get, and uh, um, one of the things I like about the, I, I was talking earlier about what kind of speakers I like to use, and I like to use those Meyer HD1s, the self-powered ones, and uh, one of the things I like about them is when you turn them way down low, they sound exactly the same as when they're at 85 dB. And uh, so this now allows me to keep the mix level way down and uh, um, still hear what I'm doing. And uh, uh, quite often when I'm in a spot where I can't decide whether the vocal level is right tucked into the next step, I'll turn the step way down so you can just barely hear it. You almost have, if you're talking, you can't hear it. So you have to concentrate. And, and it's easier to tell through the vocals. You know, I can hear the vocal and I can't hear anything else. I have to guess the vocal's too loud. Right? Um, so it's easier to tell relationships like that with things when it's turned down, tuned down very low. And uh, I haven't turned on the big speakers, you know, the main speakers in the control room in, you know, 15 years or something. I, mean, I just don't use big speakers. You know, there's uh, maybe once in a while if somebody thinks that there's some low-end problem or something, you know, I might turn them on for a second. But, uh, um, I, you know, I don't really have those things crop up because uh, I've sort of learned how to avoid them and, um, uh, 
even though the, maybe the, the HD1s don't go down to 20 cycles, you know, you can tell by looking at the meters and you can tell by experience whether you have, you can hear the 20 cycles modulating other stuff, you know, so you can, even though the speakers don't go, go that low, you can still tell if you have those kind of problems. So I don't need to have, you know, speakers that go down flat to 20 cycles and stuff to, to hear what I'm doing. And uh, know, what was the other part of the question? On uh, any way that you, mon uh, you meter. Oh, metering. Yeah. Metering for digital. Um, so it, it's, it's pretty hard with, you know, all the DAT machines that are out. Um, uh, <coughs> most of them use analog metering, even though they're digital machines. Um, uh, the, a lot of the newer ones now are using digital metering. The newer Sony units, um, the the Fostex D10s. Um, I'm not sure about the Panasonic 3700s, whether they're analog or digital metering. Um, the, I had so much confusion over it because I would be looking at one Sony, you know, sending the same thing digitally to two machines. Sony with the overlights would go over, 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 over. The Panasonic would be just fine, right? Um, so I did some tests and found out that on certain Sony machines, the overlights would come on 3 dB before you were really over. Um, the Panasonic would come on a dB and a half before you were really over. Uh, another unit would come on 3 tenths of a dB before you were really over. And uh, all the DAT machines basically cheat and they want those red lights to come on early so that you don't really go over. It makes you gun shy and you stay out of the way and, and everything's okay. So I ended up having to buy myself a meter. Um, I bought the Sony DMU30, which is the same meter section that's in a 1630 recorder. And uh, um, it has, uh, for calibrating your levels, it has a fine display where you can set it in tenth of a dB increments to get exactly the balance between the left and the right channels. And uh, inside it's got a settings where you can decide when the overlights come on by exactly how many samples it's over. You can set it for one sample over they'd come on or two or three or four or five, six, whatever you wanted. And uh, so I would basically, if I'm mixing to DAT, I would have the Sony meter and it has holds so you could look at it afterwards and and it would be holding the meters and you could see, well, this overall tune, the loudest thing is down 2 dB or down 1 dB so I can goose up the level a little bit. Um, the Fostex D10, that machine, um, has a numeric display in it that tells you how much headroom you have left. And I've gone through it tenth of a dB at a time and it's digital and very accurate and it'll tell you within a tenth of a dB what your level is. And, uh, you know, it'll tell you that you're a tenth of a dB away from clipping. Or, um, so they're very accurate meters on the Fostex. Um, so if I, if I have one of those Fostex D10s that I'm printing my mixes to, I don't even need to take my DMU30 anymore because those meters are accurate enough to do it. By the way, how does the, uh, uh, the DMU meter get its signals? That it's AESN. Okay. Um, and then it has AES in and AES out, so you can go through that meter to to the DAT machine or out of the DAT machine into that meter or something. Mm -hmm. um, so you would put it in between, say, an outboard and a Yeah, I, I use my app. I have a set of apogees that I mix to. And so I come out of the apogees. Um, uh, I usually come out one of the digital outputs of the apogees to the meter and the other digital output of the apogees because it's got three outputs. Mm -hmm. uh, the other digital output of the apogees would go to whatever I'm mixing to. And I usually mix to different formats, um, uh, especially since um, DAT machines have a tendency to uh, um, eat your tape, especially when you only have one copy of something. Right? Um, so I would usually mix to, I have an Akai a DD1000 a optical disc recorder, um, and I have a Marantz a CD610 the CDR610, the CD recorder, and then uh, one of my DAT machines. So I would mix to those three formats. So I'd punch up all three of them and send the mix to all three of them. So usually one of them would be okay. If one of them had a glitch, I would get it off the other one. And, uh, and I would have it on the optical disc recorder in case I wanted to do some uh, edits. You know, um, I mean, you could use a hard disk system on a 
uh, a Mac or whatever, too, if you wanted to. I like the optical disc because with the fixed amount of storage that you have on a hard disk, um, if you have whatever, a four gigabyte disk drive on your Mac, um, you know you're going to end up with 12 versions of each tune you're mixing to it, and you're going to, no matter, you know, you're going to run out of room, right? So then what do you do? You stop, download all the things to some DAT tape, so you clear out some room so you can do some more. Um, it starts to be a pain. So something removable is pretty much a must. Um, the, uh, I like, I started using the CDR because um, even when I was using reel-to-reel -reel Sony machines, the 3402 to print my mixes to, um, there were times when you'd spend long hours in the studio and it'd be late at night and uh, uh, you'd say to the second engineer, um, uh, I'm going to print that one again, right? You mean, in addition to the one that's on there, he thinks you mean <laughs> instead of the one that's on there, right? So we would back up and go over something um, and later on you'd go, you know, uh, what happened to that other guy? Uh, so you'd have to go get it off the DAT tape that you printed, you know, along with it, hoping that was okay. Um, so I started using the CDR to print mixes too. Uh, if there was a false start or something, who cares? Nothing could be erased. It's write only. Uh, so um, you can uh, pretty much, you know, be assured that you have a safe uh, archival thing for all the little pieces. Um, so that, anyway, the, 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 the Akai I would use if I needed to make an edit between different versions or something that I needed to edit in the mix stages. I could do it on the DD-1000 and reprint it to the other mediums and stuff. Um, on the Walter Becker album that we've uh, finished this summer, um, I used the uh, PCM 900 or 9000, 9, the Sony optical disc, because I was storing things 20 bits on there. And uh, um, so that I used the CD recorder and DAT machine for 16-bit storage. And I used the PCM 9000, um, the safety hard disk system, but I had removable two gigabyte disks. So when one filled up, I could pop it out, put another one in. And then um, Rain made this little box for me, the pack rat thing that they've been showing, which would take 20-bit stuff split it into four channels of a DA88. So I'd store my 20-bit mixes on the PCM9000, the SATI hard disk system, and uh, uh, the DA88 through this little pack rat box. So then I had two versions of 16-bit mixes and three versions of 20-bit mixes. And uh, uh, the reason I did them straight to the SATI is because we were running behind schedule the place that I was doing the mastering, Masterphonics in Nashville, used the SATI system for all their editing. So as we would print stuff, um, we'd print mixes for a couple of days, or a couple of days worth of mixes, and then I'd FedEx them a hard disk. And so they didn't have to upload it into their system. They would just take my hard disk, plug it into the SATI, um, bam, it's up on the menu, it's all there. Um, they could instantly master it. They didn't have to spend an hour uploading stuff to their hard disk system. So that worked out pretty well. Let's, am I that right? Do you have just a lot of backup versions of the mixes? Yeah, a lot of backup. You know, I would do them all in parallel because yeah. I just have a bunch of machines there. Um, uh, I suggest that if, if you're mixing to, you have one DAT machine that you're mixing to, then uh, I would print the mix to one DAT. I would take that DAT tape out, put another one in, print it again. It doesn't do you much good to print, print it once, and then let a little tape roll, print it again, because if you eat that tape, both of them are gone, right? So I'd make sure it's on a different piece of tape. Um, one thing I've learned is if you don't rewind the DAT tape, I give you worse than 50-50 odds that the machine's gonna eat the tape when you take it out. Um, if you rewind back to the beginning of the tape before you take it out, um, I have never had a tape machine eat the tape if you rewind back to the beginning first. Um, and if it did eat the tape at the beginning, um, if you leave a minute or two at the beginning with nothing on it, and it's two minutes in or three minutes in, you know, with the 1630s, when you go to a mastering lab and, and master something, they leave three minutes of blind tape on the beginning of a 1630 before there's any music starts. 
and the tape is always rewound back to the beginning and stored. So if the machine eats the beginning of the tape, it's nowhere near your master. So I do the same thing on DAT. In a, uh, I mean, I only leave maybe 30 seconds or something if I'm just making a DAT for somebody to take home and listen to. But my master DAT, um, I have three minutes before the first thing is on there. So if I wind back to the beginning and I'm taking the tape out and it eats it, um, I can get in there with a little cassette splicer and, and fix the beginning of it and put it all back together and, uh, and, and get my mixes back off if I have to. Um, the, the way, because the tape is unloaded like a videotape, um, and because of the little um, mechanisms inside the shell and all that, you're uh, standing a pretty good chance of the tape getting eaten because of uh, you know bad tensioning. And uh, the chances occur e even more often if you ha your tape's in the middle, you take it out of the machine, you put it back in the machine, and take it out a second time. Now there's like an 80% chance that it's going to eat your tape. That second time it's ejected. Because you know it, it doesn't quite take up all the slack each time that it puts the, lets the tape come out. So uh, I would say never, ever take a tape out of a machine, a uh, DAT machine, unless you've rewound it all the way back to the beginning. Another thing that happens if you take it out, you know, if you were recording on a blank DAT and you got up to the middle somewhere and you take it out to put another tape in and uh, record on that and then take it out, put this tape back in, there's a chance that when it loads up, it'll load up to a little blank piece. And uh, so you'll have missing absolute time code there for a second. And you probably won't even get absolute time code from that point on because the DAT machine, unless it reads some absolute time code, will not continue it. And it won't start at zero unless it's seen the beginning of the tape. So now you have audio that's recorded with no absolute time. And in this situation, if you were just playing from the good piece of tape across that little blank, you know, the screen would go blank for a second, and then it'd come back on and you'd see audio, but you would just see the little line going by, and you'd see no time code at all, but you'd still hear the audio. So now what's going to happen is if you go back to the beginning of the tape and you hit blank search, it's going to stop at that little, that little space before the next thing that you're now going to erase when you punch it up into record. So uh, you're much better from going back to the beginning of the tape, and uh, if you don't remember what the exact time code is or what start ID number, just hit blank search, and it'll all the DAT machines will go to the right spot and back up the right amount into the um, absolute time so that it'll be seamless absolute time from there on. Um, uh, and w which brings me to a little thing I want to mention about uh, uh, I've run into a lot of problems of uh, editing on DAT machines, where somebody's trying to, you know, you've done uh, all your mixes on one piece of uh, DAT tape, or you know, a bunch of different DAT tapes with, you know, different tunes on. You got 12 DAT tapes. Um, now you're going to compile your little thing to go over to the mastering place. Uh, you want to save money over at the mastering place, so you're going to put them all in the right order. You think the levels are all the same. You don't need any EQ, and you're going to tighten them all up nice and bitchin' so it's all done. Take it over to the mastering place. All he has to do is run off your 1630, you send it to the CD plant, make some CDs. So um, you let one tune play from your playback machine. You're recording a copy of it over here, and this one fades out, and you hit pause. And then you go find the next tune, and you get it all ready to go and all queued up and then you come out of pause just a heartbeat before the music starts and when you play them back you hear one fade out ding, 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 ding. boom the next one starts you go wow that's cool that's perfect now now go on do the next one and you sequence them all like that you send it to mastering they call you up and say you know uh the beginning of a couple of these tunes are missing you know they're just like cut off there's dropouts there well what happens is there's tolerances in dat machines and even though your DAT machine, because you're playing it back on the same one that recorded it, might go over that little area and unmute quick enough for you to hear the audio at the beginning of the next tune, um, somebody else's DAT machine probably won't do that. 
So it mutes longer and doesn't unmute till after the music's already started for the next tune. Um, and it never works out. And the mastering places always have problems with that. So you're always better off if you don't have a forehead editing DAT machine, which can allow you to have a little bit closer spaces, but there still actually is some glitches there. They're just smaller. Um, uh, let the mastering place or somebody that has you know the right equipment uh, dump your stuff into a, a sound tool system or a Sadie system or Sonic Solutions or something. Do all your sequencing on a hard disk, put it back to a DAT tape that doesn't have any edits in it, and send that over to the mastering facility. And uh, never start the stuff too close to the beginning of the tape. Um, always leave a minute or two minutes or three minutes right on the label of where the stuff starts. Um, and don't try to do any in-song edits on DAT machines. You might luck out, just like you know. I know a producer who's excellent at doing you know test edits on a cassette. He could just start. He knows exactly when to take it out of pause and listen to it. You go, ah, how does he do that? I can't do that good on sound tools. And, and uh, um, so it might come out okay on in your particular situation, but if you try to play it on somebody else's machine, there'll be a big drop out there, and it won't and it won't work. Um, uh, one other thing I wanted to say is, oh, uh, I personally know a guy who didn't get a record deal just recently because um, he was producing his own stuff, he made all these tapes, uh, they were interested in his songs, um, he made dats of everything, and he was so conscientious and put all these things close together, and, and he started on his little machine that he made the dats on, um, at the, he'd wind it back to the very beginning and he'd start it and record and then start the playback one. So as soon as you, you know, at the very beginning of the DAT was, you know, the first tune started, right? So the producer that listened to it, who was Paul Rothschild, the Doors producer, right? Um, so he listened to this stuff and he went, you know, what a, what a nerd this guy is. You know, he start, I, I can't hear the beginning of any of these songs. Because different DAT machines pull out a different amount of tape, right? So he recorded the stuff on a little portable that hardly pulled any tape out at all and started the music right at the beginning of the DAT tape. When uh, Paul played him back on a Panasonic, it was a full-size machine and pulled out more tape. The beginning of all the songs on you know, every DAT, the beginning of the song was missing. He's going, you know, this guy, this guy wants a budget to produce this stuff and he's giving me tests. You know, he says, uh, it was like I was going to sign the guy. It was right there. Um, I'm not going for it. He blew him away just because of the dat tapes that he got. And the guy that he blew away is a famous songwriter who's written number one songs and everything. Right? Hasn't been doing anything for a while. Is getting back into it and blew it just because of the you know the bad dat tapes that he sent to the guy. Pissed him off and he said that that's enough of that. Speaking of sending dat tapes and sending this. How is your had pretty good success with sending stuff through mail or FedEx? And, like, oh yeah, Fe FedEx is the best. I've had some problems with UPS. Um, you know, losing, just because losing data or damage stuff. Or just you know, things. dropping things. <laughs> um, so everybody that and I talk to people a lot, and I just and I just right now am sending tapes, all the live Steely Dan tapes that that uh, we're sending them from Nashville to New York. Um, and I sent them from wherever we were in the United States mm -hmm. to Nashville. As we fill up a box, I'd send them to Nashville. And I do it all at X because um, they're, they're really careful with stuff. And I've never had anything damaged or lost going to FedEx. Um, uh, you know, especially if you let them know, you know, magnetic material, you know, they're, they're careful with it. And, uh, and everybody I've talked to, is, they say, well, make sure you FedEx this. You know, don't set, ship it any other way. Make sure it's FedEx. And uh, the um, other way to do it would be uh, Rocket Cargo, because they they are a big music industry shipper. And uh, so if you have you know delicate equipment to ship or a lot of tapes that you want to get somewhere, um, Rocket Cargo has people that they work with that they weeded out all over the country. You know, so they get the right courier to take it to the airport, the right airline to take it somewhere. And so Rocket Cargo has always worked out pretty good. You package stuff any particular way to try and keep it. No, just a little bit of bubble pack around it, you know. Especially dat tapes are so light that uh, if you have some bubble pack, I mean, they can, you know, 
dribble them all the way through the airport and that don't happen. Any particular brand uh, of DAS that you've had bad luck with? Um, I've always had bad luck with DIC DAT tapes. Um, and every time they've given me some, uh, well, here, new solutions, you know, new shells, new this, try this. And I've, you know, I start going through the box, and I'm going, yeah, these are pretty good, these are pretty good. By the time I get to a box, I'll have one that the tape will eat, and I'll have some dropouts or something. So I just gave up on that. Um, when they came out with the data, Dats. Um, I switched over and started using those for my masters. You know, I use uh, I use Ampex or 3M most of the time for my regular copying. Uh, most of the time, Ampex um, uh, for copies that I send or reference copies that I keep. But my masters, um, I was using Data Dats because it's, they're verified, and um, they'll basically, if you use the display on a Panasonic or something, um, where uh, Ampex will be sitting there, it'll go 9, 17, 19, 9, 12, 11, 9, 7, that sort of area of error corrections. The data dats will go 0, 0, 0, 0, 3, 0, 7, 0, 0, 0. I mean, it's unbelievable. And I've had the same luck. I've actually switched over now um, from the data dats to using the Apogees. And the Apogee DAT tapes, do not they cost less than the data DATs, uh, about the same as uh, um, you know, regular audio DAT tapes. And uh, they're the same way. It's zero, zero, zero. I mean, are they in meters or time? Uh, the, the Apogee ones are in time. Uh, the, the, dat, the data DATs are in length. And uh, uh, so, a data dat that says 60 is 120 minutes. Right. They make data, data dats that say 90. I've even seen some data dats that say 120. So I can't imagine how thin that tape is. But uh, don't ever use a, dat, a data dat that's a 90 or a 120. Um, no audio decks, none of the audio decks have the sensor for the extra hole that says this is thin tape and they won't tension properly and it will eat the tape, and it won't record properly because the tension on the tape as it's going across the heads isn't correct, so it, it'll be really bad. You know, people, I've been, wow, I've been using these 90s, I've three hours on a data, wow, all my mix is in one tape, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's so thin you can see through it. So I'd stay away from those. And uh, I've been using exclusively uh, Apogee Dats for the last uh, two years, probably, since they first came out with it. And uh, um, I'm satisfied with that. And I've gone through a lot of them. I went through uh, 600 of them over the summer. You know, doing we had uh, we were recording out in front of the house during the shows, um, two dads per show. And I was doing on stage my mixes from the 48 track, two dads per show. And then I made uh, uh, three copies of each of the shows for Donald and Walter and myself. And uh, you know, I went through 600 dats, and I didn't have any problems with all of them. I went back and checked them, and all the errors were always, you know, zero, three, zero, zero. And uh, so, how about optical media? Um, the same thing. Have you had any preferences or um, stay away from? I, I stick with the Sony stuff. I've tried other uh, optical media, and I've always ended up back to the Sony. Whenever I've had a dropout or some problem. I've looked at it, and it wasn't one of the Sony discs. Um, and uh, so I'm just, you know, Sony's always been pretty good with with uh, with tape and optical media, and, and they have the highest density recorders and stuff right now. Uh, they pretty much know what they're doing, and uh, so I just stick with the Sony, and it's not, you know, it's about the same price, really. And uh, um, I don't know what, uh, media sources and stuff that are up here, but um, I usually use a place called Project One in Los Angeles. Um, they stock everything. And the prices, from, and I, I had an account at Ampex and an account at 3M for my own stuff. And uh, this place, Project One, goes through so much tape that I can buy one roll and have them FedEx it to me and it costs me exactly the same amount as if I buy five cases directly from Ampex or 3M, you know, because they buy, you 
know, hundred thousand dollars a year worth of tape, more than that, you know, from from each of those manufacturers. So they get like, you know, prices that nobody gets. And uh, so when they first started out, all the studios hated them, right? Because the studios would buy tape and mark it up a hundred percent and sell it to the clients, and then the client could just go down and get the tape cheaper than the studio pays for it by just getting it at Project One. And then all the studios started saying, well, uh, we have to charge you a, a core charge, yeah. If you're bringing your own tape, it's got to be this much. So I just started telling the studios that well, I'm, I'm doing overdubs, right? So I come in, I just, yeah, I already formatted the tape, I'm overdubbing everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I've been optical stuff signing. Yes? Um, I haven't heard the 1000 yet. So um, I have the, the D to A 1000. I still have the A to D 500. I don't have my 1000 yet. Um, you know, I'm supposed to get it this week. Um, so I haven't played with that. Um, as far as converter wise, uh, I know that uh, Doug Sachs, um, from uh, Doug Sachs Mastering in LA, who hates everything digital, um, he was it uh, two weeks ago, I guess. Three weeks ago, he uh, did a little shootout and had the Apogee uh, A to D 1000 over there, and uh, he ended up buying one. Um, and so it's his first uh, analog to digital converter. So he liked it, and but he wasn't using the mic preamps. Um, I don't know what the mic preamps are like. You know, I haven't really had any use. You know, if I got mine, I probably wouldn't try them because you know, I don't really have. Too much occasion to record, uh, you know, uh, stereo mic directly to that machine. Um, so, I, I, to answer your question, I don't know what the mic is for. Yes. Uh, a couple of things, Roger. Um, can you give us any insights you might have on uh, recent data compression and reduction schemes you've come across? And what was whatever uh, became. What's the fallout on the uh, MD versus Phillips fiasco? Uh, yeah, I noticed Radio Shack's dumping them out. Um, but I also <coughs> noticed that there's uh, um, uh, there's DCC uh, portables now. I've seen you know in a few of those electronic supermarket places. But uh, I think it's pretty much DCC is uh, slipping dramatically and and. Mini disc. There are like tons of different mini disc products now, right? They've got the cart machine replacements for the radio stations and uh, all these uh, different things they're coming out with. Which is, you know, I think that's, I mean, it's a thousand times better than a cart machine. You know, I don't think it was ever meant to replace uh, replace CDs. Um, it was meant to replace cassettes, which uh, I think it's, you know, a mini disc is much better than. Um, uh, cassette, and it's much better than uh, an A track and this loop tape. Um, so, so I think it's pretty much found its niche, and uh, you know it's doing pretty good for that. I mean, I I have a little mini disc recorder that I take around with me on on the road to listen to things, and and uh, you know it doesn't sound as good as a DAT, but it's real close, you know. And uh, uh, so for just. Uh, Remedial listening. <laughs> um, I think it's I think it's just fine, you know. And I wouldn't feel bad about uh, you know making a mini disc copy for somebody to take home and listen to something. You know, uh, I think mini disc probably sounds better than you know 15 IPS two track. You know, as far as you know taking stuff home to listen to and things like that. Um, what was the other part of the question? I forgot already. Uh, are Are you aware of any other? What are oh, the latest data compression, data compression and reduction schemes that are well, really voiced on us? Um, I don't know. I think that's probably going to be it, except for, um, you know, uh, I don't know. There's probably going to be some stuff coming up for, you know, making more than eight tracks out of an eight track and <coughs> things like that. But, but those are things that you have to weigh what you want to, do you want, you know, 20 tracks on a Task MD88 and sacrifice, you know, have them all be mini disc quality, or do you, uh, 
want to stick with eight tracks and have them be 16-bit, or four tracks and have them all be 20-bit, or you know, so at least you can decide what application you're putting it to. And, you know, you're not forced into one or the other. But there's you know all these uh, the MPEG and and some of these other compression schemes. A lot of things are coming up because of you know CD-ROM stuff. You want to get good compression schemes so that you can get better than 8-bit stuff live off of the CD-ROMs. Um, so, uh, I don't know, there's a bunch of stuff that they're playing with, but, you know, pretty much they're all going to do something. I haven't really run across anything better than 2 to 1 that uh, doesn't lose a little bit of something. You know, I mean, you have a, you have a computer file and you compress it uh, five to one and then bring it back, um, there's something that it had to interpolate. You, know, you, can't, you can't do five to one yet without some kind of loss. And it just depends on what, what you want to lose. Does somebody, yeah. I had a question. I want to bounce back to acoustics a little bit. Um, I, my opportunities to get into good rooms for vocals is limited. and. Uh, one of the problems I have is that I run into a lot of bad sounding rooms basically for vocals. And I was wondering if uh, if you have any kind of techniques for fixing bad rooms, you know, things the techniques that you would use to minimize the effects of a bad environment. Why? I mean um, within reason, I mean, you know, you know, I mean, can't be in an echo chamber. Yeah. I mean, it's uh it's it's pretty hard. I mean you can you know go in a little closet or something and, you know, if it's a big room like this that sounds bad, um, just, you know, baffle your brains out to build a little a little closet kind of thing that you can you know, get rid of all, yeah, deaden, you know, if, uh, if, if the room sounds bad, it's because the acoustics of the room are adding into the vocal, and so get rid of those however you can, those two trap things or, um, you know, uh, blankets over gobos or whatever you have to do to like minimize those sort of things and try some asymmetrical positioning in the room. I mean if it's you know a square room and the glass is like this, you know, instead of being square against the glass or square against the corner, you know, make it like a 37 degrees off this way or something and cheat it over a little bit this way to try to make uh, you know minimize space problem and things like that. Yeah, make make it uh, uh, you know, asymmetrical inside, and how you put the gobos and stuff so that there won't be symmetrical reflections and things. And uh, um, uh, I don't know, it's really hard. If there's a if there's a door on the little room, you know, the vocal booth or something, open the door and leave the door open. And if the door comes into the control room, you're just trying to keep you know minimum amount of stuff running in the control room or something, and uh, and everybody be quiet. So this you know as some escape for some of those reflections. You know, sometimes that can help a lot just by leaving the door open to the little room. Um, or, you know, try doing it in the control room. You know, I've seen people that do like to do, engineer their, artists who like to engineer their own vocals, you know, and ride the knob and sing with the microphone in front of the console and stuff. You know, um, I've done, in the mixing room at Masterphonics, I've done vocals for a whole album in a room that's just for mixing. And, uh, um, I'd have the artist, I'd put the microphone right here between the glass and the console, you know, and have the singer aiming this way and baffle off the glass or put a blanket over the glass to get that side reflection off. And uh, so the artist would be just on this side singing. We'd have earphones on and uh, use the control room instead of the whatever booth for the vocal. Uh, so, I don't know, it's a hard one, but you just gotta you know, try some things like that. I'm going to lay down on the floor and sing facing up. <laughs> <laughs> Hang up from the ceiling facing down. Yeah. You might be uh, tall to follow the end of the formal part of the evening and then you your lungs stay on for a little longer and talk to Okay. Well, thanks a lot. I hope uh, I said something interesting. <laughs>